So we start the second session of the day, and I think uh, so. Let me introduce Passat Patei, and uh, I think he's uh, here we go now. Okay. Okay. Is it? It's on now. Uh, yeah. So my name is Pastor Fati. I'm a postdoc at the University of York. I work with Brian Forrest in the group, and this is joint work with Carol from the University of Connecticut. Sitting there, Brian, and in this talk, I'm going to talk about the role of the scaffolding protein in the assembly of P22 with the help of math. So you're going to see that some mathematics. So the aim of this study is to develop a mathematical model for the assembly of P22 and then use that model to understand the role of scaffolding 14, what about the, what are the impacts of bias concentration of scaffolding 14 on it, and how scaffolding 14 helps this to happen. Then we want to compare this with PS mediated assembly. So because we know that for single stranded RNA viruses, they use PS mediated assembly mechanism for the assembly. For double stranded DNA viruses like P22, they have that scaffolding 14 mediated assembly. So compare these two how they are similar, how they are different, and so on. So for the PS mediated assembly, so first to just know what they are. So packaging signals, or PSS, so there are multiple, many viral genomes, they have multiple dispersed sequence motifs that if they are presented in a specific secondary structure, like this example, these affinity for capsid protein, we call them packaging signals. And packaging signals both act collectively to promote the formation of virons. And they have been observed in many viruses like MS2, SCMV, HPV, HPV, and then this is going to go as time goes on. And their discovery was a joint work between Peter's, Peter's lab in the University of Leeds and Wyden's group in the University of York. So to see how the signal works in the assembly, so Eric, who is also here, Develop a model for the assembly of viruses by the help of packaging signal. So it's a not simple model, but it's about on the door dodecahedron. So then we have 12 pentagons, and then you have a genome that has 12 packaging signals on it, and then they point to the center of the, the pentamers, and then the assembly happens around it. So in his work, he started out was he wants to understand what is the type of packaging signal and what's the impact of having code proteins all at once or gradually how the assembly happens. So what he observed was that he created lots of random cases. So we have 12, each node shows a packaging signal, so we have 12 packaging signals. They are all the strong packaging signals, they are green, they are intermediate blue, or the weak ones are red. So what we observed that RNA1, which has a combination of weak and strong packaging signals, actually performs the best in the assembly, and the RNA that has 12 strong packaging signals on it, it doesn't work well. It just produces lots of malformed cases. So it just shows that when we say the act collectively means that we don't need all the strong, so you need a combination of them to be successful. And then what we did at the end was about that when we have the genome inside the capsid, so we have, we know that like this packaging signal is binding to here and then here, then we have like an assembly pathway. So the RNA is passed from a point, goes around, and then ends. So, but then it could have many options. So it could start from here, go up, and then down. So all these assembly pathways, which we call them Hamiltonian pathways, it's a mass phase. So we just know the assembly pathways, let's call them. What we observe that if for RNA1, code 14, or if you add the code 14 gradually, if you ramp up the code 14, 91% of cases, they just use a limited number of pathways. And to be sure that the packaging signal kind of reduces the number of pathways in the assembly to make sure it, it happens efficiently. But if the package, if the code 14 has been already there, we see that to get to 90%, you're already using 1,000 options of the assembly. So it's packaging signal makes sure that the assembly to be efficient. So these are all for single standard or environment. So now we want to do something for P22, which is a double stranded DNA virus. So, probably you know better than me. It's a four copies made of 420 code proteins, acoustic asymmetry, P equals 7. The assembly is different. First, the staff, first the code is formed by the help of the scaffolding protein. 
then the DNA goes inside through the, through the pore that it has. So, but now, yes, the, how the assembly is happening. Here, we are, I'm showing a kind of a mathematical representation of a hex number here. So, we know that in the prototype, the hex numbers are skewed. So, we have a skew line in the hex number. So, we have each monomer. Each monomer has a site for the binding of the scaffold, the protein. And then we have a skew line on the, in, in each hex number. So, now, let's investigate see what are the role of species in the assembly. Again, here, I'm looking at the infraction network here. So we are representing each monomer by a node, and we're connecting those nodes that if the monomers are binding together, like for example, this monomer is binding to that monomer, so we connect them. This is binding to that, so we connect them. So we have three binding patterns, three distinguished from binding infractions. Either between pentamer hexamer or between hexamer hexamer, blue or inside the pentamer, which is that magenta, or on this Q line, which is blue. So each of them had a different strength. And now, how to add the C's to our uh, model so it's like each monomer can either be occupied with an SP, which we are showing them by gold, or it doesn't have any SP on them, which we show them by maroon. So, gold ones are CP with a scaffolding protein on them, so we call them CS, and maroon ones are CP. So, now from now on, I'm just going to talk more about CS, scaffold, scaffolding protein on a cold protein. So, then if you Show them on a top seat, so that's how it's going to look. So we're going to have lots of dots, golden, maroon, golden, maroon, and that's how the whole thing will look like. But now, what are the rules for the assembly that we want to put in our model? So we don't put that much assumptions, so we just say the assembly initiates around the fiber symmetry axis, which makes sense because in the real infection, the assembly happens around the portal, and the portal sits on a fiber symmetry axis. So we say that the assembly starts around the fiber symmetry axis. So the model definitely depends on the level of CS, CP plus SP, and the CP. We have three types of interactions, so the strength of these ones also matters, and the probability of getting CS in each side. So what's the probability of having a scaffolding protein here or not? So these, these are what the model depends on them, and then how we implemented it. We assume that first the pentamer is formed, all of them, five monomers are there, they all have pattern, they all have scaffolding protein on them, which is kind of our portal, and then things goes around it and out to form the whole capsule. So, for the probabilities, how we decided about the probabilities? We decided, we kind of divided the capsule into two, two parts, the lower part, the, the upper part, so each, for example, for the lower half, we have these, each of them are shows are a global three-fold symmetry axis or a local three-fold symmetry axis or kind of, this is not even a local, we have a hexamer, hexamer, and hexamer. So in, in, in each side, you see that we have three sides for the binding of the scaffolding protein. So in each case, what is the baseline probability to have one scaffolding protein here? We call that PL, like for this one, PL3, PL2, PL2, PL1. This is the probability of having one scaffolding protein. Then, what's the proba then we say that the probability of getting the second one is reduced by factor of PD, probability of dimerization. Then the probability of having the third one, PP, the dimerization. And then, of course, the, the concentration matters to the coefficient of that, how many CS and CP we have in our system, to find also the probability. So, based on all these factors, we put them in the model, and then, uh, so now, for example, for this case, we assume that the, the baseline probability, the probability for having the first speed is 1 in the lower half, in the upper half, as it's almost quite formed, the probability is reduced by a factor of mu, but mu could be 1, so it's more than you could do whatever you want with it. Then various values of mu, PD, PT, and then various concentrations, see how the assembly goes on. For example, for this video that I'm going to play now, we assume that mu is 80%, Probability of dimerization is 70% and trimerization is 20%. And if I play and we assume that there are 200 code 14 and 400 code 14 video scaffolding, and then the video looks like that. Beautiful. So, all, in all cases, we just use static, statistically make a decision do I want to put a maroon one? or a golden one and how the assembly moves on. 
Then what we did, we kind of did like 300 simulations, but now we have three captive forms. So in each, then we kind of slice each captive and look at in each slice how many scaffolding proteins, how many golden dots we have here, how many golden dots we have here. See how the distribution of scaffolding protein changes as you go away from the portal to the end. So this is kind of shows how this how the distribution looks. Of course, at the beginning is one because beginning is the portal, is the assembly, is the is the is when everything happens. So it's always one, but then as you move on, it just fluctuates, goes up, down, down, and then it gradually settles down. What Carol kind of told us about the assembly of P22 was that. They observe that as they increase the number of SPs, increase the concentration of SP, the assembly was getting better and better and better and better, but then when there was too much scaffolding protein, the assembly was falling halfway through. So they were seeing just half of the So it gets better and better and better, and then a sudden drop, nothing is formed. So we want to see that under what condition our model can show this behavior. So as it's a model, so we want to put a to the end very happy. We always assume that there's a certain number of CP and CS. Then it was Carol's idea to say that when we go, when the assembly happens, if the distribution shows a sudden dip, we could cut off the distribution here. So we have a cutoff level. If the, if the distribution of SP goes below a certain value, it's hard for, for, for the capsule to pass that point. And we could, so we want to see under what condition we could see this behavior. For example, here, if probability of primarization is zero, dimerization is 80%, we could see that if we increase the level of CS, means if we increase the level of scaffolding protein, the dip in center it gets sharper and sharper and sharper. So 15% is not like a, it's not a legit rigid number. It just gets, as we increase this number, this dip gets sharper and sharper and sharper. So kind of shows why it stops around the center, why this is all is happening. And this is kind of similar to what we were seeing to packaging signals. Twelve strong packaging signals was bad. And here, having too much scaffolding protein is bad. But there are some similarities here between packaging signal and scaffolding protein mediated assembly. Then we want to see that, is it, does it happen all the time or not? This is not a bad thing. Like if for, the, for this case, we had PD equal to 80%. But what if PD is 60%? And now we are changing the CS, changing CP, and then look at the percentage of assembly when we do like a thousand simulation. For example, if CP is 400, as you increase CS, there's it just the assembly is always 100%. There's no, it never goes below that cutoff level. Or if you increase the PT to 20%, that's again the case. For 600, we just in fact, beginning is too bad, then it gets better, and it never it never goes below that cutoff level. This kind of shows that scaffolding protein likes to form dimers with a high probability, but it doesn't like to form trimers. Because forming trimers means that this stalling will never happen, something that you are seeing in the experiment. So then, if we want to have the similar behavior, this means that scaffolding protein probably doesn't like too much to form a primer. Then what we did next, we looked at the past phase, something that Eric did in his work for the packaging signal, to see if we could see similar behavior, to see that if scaffolding protein that reduces the number of assembly passes. For that, we found the dominant assembly passes. So to find the dominant assembly passes, so we do simulation, like a thousand simulation, put them, so the, the capsule has, has 420 positions. Let's number them, one, two, three, four, five, so in one assembly, it first goes one, and then three, and then five, or then two, the other passage maybe starts from two, and then four, so each of them, for each row, gonna be a list of numbers. Then we look at the first position, what's the most repeated number? We, we call it like the mode. So then we pick each one. Then for those that they have the most repeating first position, now we look at the second position. What's the most repeated position that? And then, and, and so on and so on, till we go to the last one. So now in that case, we could have the dominant pathway. Then we want to see how much other pathways are similar to the dominant one. Like for example, this mode does this 
drops off quickly? Does it take a long time for it to drop or not? What are the impacts? And then what are the impacts of changing a space concentration or CS and having code forking either gradually or at once? Which in this case, we didn't see that much of an idea. Like, for example, this shows, this graph shows the similarity with the dominant path state. So, of course, at the beginning, they are all similar. Portal or the, the, the initialization step, they are all have five scaffolding for, five scaffolding for on it. So, the similarity is one at the beginning. But we see that the similarity drops quickly when CS is 300. And when we increase CS, it gets a bit better, but not something that you could say, oh wow, now it's always space up. No. Again, it, it drops quickly. Like, for example, if you look at the 50% of assets, after 5% five, after five of the capacity is assembled, then it almost just goes around. Just each of them has, each of them choose their own aspect to get to before complete. This is extends for the packaging signal. First of all, you, know, you have the 12 options to, to go through. Then you have an RNA that points to this one, then the next one should be close to it. But here, you have four capsules, 420 positions. So if you could add here and then there, you know, you, you could do whatever you want. You don't have that much restrictions here. Of course, CS makes it better, but not a lot. But over in this case, CP wasn't being added gradually. Here, CP was already in the system. And even for packaging signal, you observe that if CP is already in the system, the process could be anything. You don't have any restriction. Then we saw that, okay, now let's add port protein gradually to our system and then see what happens. So the black shows for the case that the port protein is already in the system, and red shows for the case that as the top state is getting assembled, we are adding code for playing to our system. So this is again shows the similarity with the dominant path state. It gets better, but you could say that it improves it by a factor of two, almost by a factor of two. You remember there, 50% was around 5%, but now 50% is around 10%. So it takes 10% of the top state till it starts going around like really diverse choose many pathways. But still, it's hard to say that even if we add the CP gradually, the geometry gets fixed by the help of scaffolding protein. So scaffolding protein doesn't dictate the way that it assembles. So it may definitely helps with the geometry, how the geometry fits, how to make sure I put it in the right place with the right angle, but not where I put it, it doesn't matter. You, you choose where you want to put it, and I make sure I put it in the right way. Then at the end conclusion, so what our model shows that the SP concentration, if for high SP concentration, we see and start around the equator. So of course, this was being observed in the experiment, but then the model could capture that. Like for example, the model was showing a dip close to equator, but this dip didn't happen at the beginning or in the end of it, so which kind of shows the model is, 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 is a good model. Then also what we saw that there's an ideal range for a scaffolding protein, like if I go here, you could see if it's too low, it's bad. I mean, of course, here there's no stalling, but if, if you assume there's a stalling here, if it's too low, it's bad. If it's too high, it's bad. There's always a golden range, which, uh, yeah, that's not bad, but anyway. Uh, but yeah, there, there's always a golden range that in that one, if 100% below is bad, above is bad. And then we, this is what's really nice. I really like that result. That SP mainly for dimers and less package for fibers. This is kind of the model. So if you let it keep on fibers, it never solves. But if you don't, it always goes up. And then the SP concentration doesn't dictate the assembly pathway. The assembly pathway can divert. It doesn't tell it where to go as long as it does it rightly. And then, uh, yeah, I want to again thank Friden and Carol for all their work and starting this work. And of course, all the funders, Welcome Trust, EPSRC, Royal Society, except mainly EPSRC, who pays for my post account, and NIH and Full Bike Program. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>
Nope. But how how do the simulations actually work? What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, how do you decide whether they stick together or something? Yeah, so how does simulation work? So, B. So we have we have this as a base for simulation. So we put for, for around the five for symmetry axis for the first part for symmetry. We put these on all golden, and then now what would be the next position that stick that points to where we have? So we could say that the next position that we could occupy is this one and that one and that one and that one and that one. So it just then the code looks what are the next possible places that binds. Then it looks at the binding affinity and whether they have a scaffolding protein on it or not, and then makes a decision based on that, and then picks up the next one, and then fills the next one, and then the next one. So it's different than a DLSP uh, algorithm that you, it, you it, the concentration can change. Here we fix the concentration, because what we are looking for here is about the rules of the assembly. Yes, you know, the numbers are there, you have them. Now, based on these rules, assemble. And then show me how you behave. Here. So it's. Uh, I hope I answered fine. Yeah. But I will could talk more about because I don't want to do too, too much of mathematics and equations here. So. Okay. Second question: A lot of proteins will just assemble like this. Yeah. How would have you done simulations on node? Oh yeah, for the uh, yeah, it's um, I, I, yeah. No, but again, for those ones, the assembly happens by the help of something. Like for example, for the smaller one, are the RNAs help? But for the best one, no, 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 I know. Like for T equals three, like you could say that maybe there are cases that it, ha it the assembly happens without the help of scaffolding protein or the RNA. But then it's about adding this figure. We want to make sure it has the right geometry, and the scaffolding protein makes sure that the geometry is right. Higher three numbers to make. I think T7 is the beginning of the need of a scaffolding protein, and as they go bigger, it's just, I, I mean, the model shows that it doesn't show the assembly task, it doesn't fix the assembly task, it just want to make sure that everything sits in the right way and the right angle. It's more about that, make sure the geometry is right. Right there, I think that's the rule. And for a smaller one, it's easier for it to fix the geometry. Uh, there are so many questions. I think that the first was Lowry, and maybe after Lowry we move on. And uh, the other one's going to be like Okay, so we are happy to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, so, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the concentrations. So, you mentioned that the low concentration is bad, the high concentration is bad, the golden middle. How sort of biological relevant are the concentrations that you are using? Is it that you know the high concentration would be something that would never occur in a cell, or is there a mechanism for the virus to kind of keep the concentration straight? Yes. The, the, the experiments that our lab did was based on just put scaffolding protein and cold protein in a test tube, something like that. I mean, is there she can tell you more? Maybe I'm just wrong, but, but I think it was more about that we have them, let them assemble, see how it goes. But there's something, for example, the virus the recycles the scaffolding protein that it has. I think the virus, maybe one of the reasons that it's recycling scaffolding protein to make sure that the concentration stays fixed. It doesn't produce maybe too much scaffolding protein. And then, because there are, like Eric probably in his talk going to talk about it, the virus sometimes regulates how much of a protein it produces. So it probably doesn't produce too much scaffolding protein. And it just uses what it has to make sure that the concentration doesn't go too high or too low to stay in the black golden range. But this is probably needs more and more experiment to, to be put. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next speaker is uh, my friend, Wei Adam. And I think that uh, you can start straight because we have. Hi everyone, my name is Mavanli Adams. I'm a postdoc and doctor at Dimitri Gilarov Group at the John Innes Center. Um, but today I will be talking to you about the work that I did in my postdoc uh, while I was at Cornell University. So I'm a little bit of an oddball. Um, I will be talking about plant viruses, which is a little bit different uh, to what's been I'm buying time for the pointer to respond. We have Thank you. 
Is it there? There we go. So uh, the plant viruses in question today are ludiovirus. Um, they're also known as PEL viruses, uh, virus nomenclature is always changing, um, but they have three genera. So coloviruses, enamoviruses, and ludioviruses. So these are non-enveloped viruses uh, that have a positive sense of single-stranded RNA genomes, and they target a variety of plant hosts and cause extensive crop loss. You can see some of the uh, examples on the slide right now. Um, and up until recently, there was no structural information known about any of these viruses. And so one of the reasons for that is that the viral infection and replication happens in the phloem of the host plant. So you can blend up millions of plants and make a plant smoothie, and you won't get enough um, virus uh, to do these structural studies. And so that was one of the limiting factors up until recently. So we have three players in today's story. We have the host plant, we have the virus, and we also have the insect vector, which is how the virus is going to move between plants. And so what happens is you have this hungry aphid that comes along, and it comes and it sucks up the sap from the phloem uh, of the plant. And the virus will then move into either the mid-gut or the hind-gut. Um, uh, it will get ingested with the sap. And it will then cross the first cellular barrier. So it will cross um, through the gut barrier into the hemolymph, uh, sort of the body cavity, the blood of the aphid, and it will circulate around in the aphid. And then it will move to the either the accessory salivary gland or salivary gland cross a second cellular barrier, and then aphids stick when they feed, and so the virus will then get stopped back out in a subsequent feeding. And that is what completes the transmission process of these viruses between plants. It goes on a journey. This, this virus is moving uh, like across two cellul cellular barriers. Right? What is the point of that? Why is it moving throughout the entire aphid body? How is this happening? It also does not replicate or encoat in the aphid at all. Um, and this virus, will, uh, this aphid, will remain viriculous for its entire life. Um, so my background is in structural biology, and one of the questions that we can answer is, how is this happening? And so I'll introduce you to the structural proteins. So this is a representative genome of uh, poliroviruses, uh, ludioviruses, and it has two structural proteins. So open reading frame three, uh, we're going to call the coat protein. I don't really need to explain too much about coat proteins to this audience. Optimal viral packaging system in a protected genome. Uh, it's a T3 viral particle with 180 coat proteins uh, and 60 asymmetric units. And so we wanted to find that, you know, we've never seen the structure of this, although it's known that it's a T3 viral particle. What does this look like? And so we were attempting to crystallize this, and we got these horrible looking crystals, and they horribly diffracted. And as tends to happen with crystallography, as we're in the midst of optimizing, uh, you know, feeding, all of doing all these fun things with the crystals, along comes Cryoam and sort of stamps out all of our hopes and dreams and says, you know, Cryoam will do it better. And so a group out of Leeds, Neil Ransom and George Lomonosov, um, who I actually now have the pleasure of working right next door to at the John Innes Center, um, they solved the Cryoam structure to 3.4 angstrom resolutions um, and so that it is a T3 viral particle. And they were able to sort of get over that issue of this virus being flown limited by making virus-like particles. So they were able to basically make empty viral particles, and this enabled mass production of the viruses uh, to be cryoam. So they observed some unclear density in the particle, which they believed to be RNA, but it offered no insight into viral assembly. And the reason that I bring this up is um, this structure came out right before COVID hit. And so then we went into lockdown, and I had this diffraction, and I thought, well, I'm, I may as well solve the crystal structure of the coat protein. So I solved, uh, using molecular replacement, the crystal structure of the coat protein of um, this PLRV uh, structure, and we get this um, sort of uh, this jelly roll-like fold. And now you're thinking, the family, you have this at 1.8 angstroms, cryovam is at 3.4, high resolution means amazing insights into something. And the answer is absolutely not. So when you align, uh, the crystal structure and the cryoam coat protein. So in orange, you see the crystal construct that we had, and in green, you see the cryoam structure. You align the coat proteins, flawless. It looks really good. Still in lockdown, still wondering what to do. So what we did is we took a look at the crystal packing itself. So this is how these coat proteins pack into our crystal. And what you're seeing are very distinct sort of sheets of protein, right? And if you take one of those sheets out, and you sort of have this overhead view of, of, the, of the one protein sheet from the crystal. 
your eye is seeing a lot of symmetry, and I'll draw your attention to the icosahedral asymmetric unit that you're seeing sort of right there. However, when you compare the two lattices, what you see, so on, on your left, you're going to see the crystal. On the right, you're seeing the cryo reconstruction. So the similarities between the two is that you are seeing twofold and threefold rotational axes of symmetry. However, in our crystal structure, you're seeing sort of hexagons, a hexameric lattice. But in the cryo you're seeing a pentameric lattice, right? And, and one is flat and one is curved, as it should be. But it looks like if you look at the relative orientations of the end termini uh, within our crystal, they're all oriented downwards, right? And so the question is like, well, how do you transition from this seat? We were really close. Like, how do you get from this seat to this mature casket? It's not as though these coat proteins in the crystal were just randomly oriented. They have sort of a desired confirmation and sort of associations that they want to make if something was missing um, to getting from this seat to mature casket. So what we did, and, and one of the reasons, sorry, one of the reasons why we asked this question is with these kinds of biases, there are two models for casket assembly. I'm sure, given the audience here, there are maybe more models for casket assembly. Um, but the two uh, sort of main ideas behind this is that one is RNA sequence specific and one is based on the protein protein interactions. And so, what we did is we sort of took our, we took the cryon structure and we sort of, we then basically crossed that sheet, we modeled that sheet directly on top of the cryon structure. And we wanted to find the maximum region of overlap. Is there even a region of overlap between the two sort of systems, right? And what we were able to find, what we saw is that the maximum region of overlap is the dimer of asymmetric units, so around the twofold rotational axis symmetry. And so when you lock those two, when you lock that dimer in place, when you lock those six co proteins in place, you can see that the orange sort of crystal speed goes on into infinity, and the cryolium sort of capsid begins to fall down as it, as it should be, right? And so when you sort of look, oops, when you look, um, when you look at these sort of moving, when you morph between um, sort of the sheets, so you lock the two, um, the, the dimer of asymmetric unit in place, and you look at the movement from sort of what the sheet could be, so you could either go into a sheet, which is possible, or you could transition downwards into a, into a particle, right? And you can see that this is happening very smoothly. You know, there's no sort of clashing going on, and you can see from the top view, almost like a breathing sort of sort of appearance. And you can see right here, you've got your uh, dimer of asymmetric units right here locked in place, and there's this pinching happening along the threefold seams. So there's no disassembly or reorganization required. Um, we sort of sort of discovered or sort of seen what the the minimal building block is to generate two assemblies. Um, you have this dimer of asymmetric units that nucleus lattice formation. However, you need pentamers um, that, that is required for cell closure. And so these interactions between proteins are pre programmed and self limiting. And for the astute sort of viewer of this talk, you will have seen that our crystal construct was missing the first 68 residues. And so I'm happy to talk uh, at another time about how we tried to get sort of assembly and we try to get to your proteins with those 68 residues, but it was very unstable. And so we have some problems there. So we think that RNA is needed to drive that cur curvature, and that happens with association of the antennas. But, okay, cool, you got the, like, you just showed some comparison with the cryolium. But what about the viral, other viral components? And this is something that the cryolium structure missed. And so we'll go back to the two structural approaches. We talked about open reading frame three. We'll talk about open reading frame five which we are going to call a read three domain. And so this happens, as the name suggests, by a leaky stock codon. Um, and so the capsid itself, the full capsid is made up of some combination of just co-proteins, but also some of that elongated version, so some combination with read three protein as well. And so how often does a leaky stock codon get read through? And I can tell you greater than zero and less than 100. Um, so that's something that we're also interested in looking at. And so we can talk a little bit about leaky stock codons, translational read through, it makes key viral proteins. So if you make that stock codon functional in this virus, so uh, you're essentially only making coke proteins, that particle will be infectious but not transmissible. And if you delete out the stock codon, every protein made has both coke protein and read through domains, so it's a long thing. The virus cannot assemble. So what that tells us is that that read-through domain is important for transmission, but that the read-through domain is also very bulky. 
So um, we can divide up the weed food domain into two sections. We have the end terminal portion and the C terminal portion. The end terminal portion, if we think back to our, our big question at the beginning, how is this virus moving through the aphid body during transmission? Um, we want to look at the end terminal weed food portion. And we want to know how this is arranged on the capsid. And so we ended up crystallizing three of these from three different um, uh, uh, species, potatoes, turnips, and cereals. Um, and so these are constitutively a diamond. And so when you look at this, you see this really nice uh, sea peptide coming up through, through the center of the two monomers and wrapping around the outside uh, of the diamond. Now, I've mentioned two before. So we have this diamond, right? We have a diamond that makes up this NOTD. And we want to know how many uh, weed fruit domains are positioned on the capsid for its surface, right? And so if we model now this NRTD onto that dimer that I talked about that is required for capsid nucleation, you can model an NRTD across every two-fold rotational axis of symmetry. And it fits really nicely. It looks good. It seems like it can fit there. And if you look at it sort of a space-filling model, you can see that, you know, spatially, there's no issues with having this NRTD sitting across every two-fold rotational axis of symmetry. So, in theory, this should read through 100% of the time. However, um, there's also this deep terminal portion, which is most likely sort of sterically quite bulky, and it's preventing incorporation of um, this read through domain into every single sort of post protein that, that, that makes up the capsule. And so, I, I, I've now moved from crystallography into clylium, and I know that a lot of people are probably going, well, why don't you just solve the clylium structure of this? Um, and the issue, because we sort of, up until this point, sort of built our virus piecewise. So we have the coke protein, we have the NRTD, we now need to see what the CRTD is doing. Um, but the issue with a lot of this is that viruses tend to fall apart on, on grids. And so there are some technical issues trying to get these into, into grids. Um, the one sort of other biological sort of snippet I will leave you with as well um, is that if you take just the NRTD protein, so just that protein on its own, and you put it on a plate, or you know, a fancy science plate, and you feed aphids on this NRTD. And then you take that aphid and you move that aphid onto an infected plant. You then have the aphid feed, and in theory, it should be taking up viruses from that plant. And then you move it onto an uninfected plant, and you see what the transmission rate is. If, they, if you have pre fed aphids with this NRTD, the reduction of uh, viral transmission is greatly reduced. Um, and so this, uh, and, and many other things, uh, is going to be used sort of ideally as, as a novel sort of um, insecticide and pesticide for helping prevent the transmission of this virus in between plants. And so with that, I have two labs to thank Dr. Cornell University, um, Michelle Heck and Josh Jaffe, um, sort of uh, co-supervised this project. And then we got most of our funding from the USDA to do this. Uh, four months ago, I moved here uh, to work at the John Innes Center, uh, just down south from here. Um, and I work in uh, Dmitry Dolorov's group, um, sort of also with Tony Maxwell. And so, um, so, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Love it. Thank you. Uh, super interesting. Uh, maybe you haven't found that yet, but do you have any speculation on the RTD blocking the translation? Does it block the translation from the gut to the hemolymph and yes. or from the hemolymph to the salivary glands or both? Yes, so we have, we're very grateful to our great collaborators. And what you can do is you can inject, you have two the barriers, right? The gut and the salivary glands. So if you bypass the gut and you inject just an RTD into the hemolymph, so you've now bypassed the gut. And the only barrier that the NRTD could now touch is the salivary gland. It still transmits at the same efficiency as wild type. So the main limiting barrier is the gut barrier. That's where the specificity is happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the red one. Yes, they're different in 2D versus 3D, yes. Uh, 
Um, if, if something gets flipped out, no, we don't. We don't believe that that's. Oh, in terms of just the, the overlapping, they're exactly the same. The tiny, tiny deviations, like very, very, very small deviations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't uncoat or replicate or do anything in the ocean. Yeah. No, the foam is such a tiny, tiny part of the foam. When you blend them, yeah, it's, it's yeah. I have a question. So, when there is this breathing movement, yeah. do they lose the interaction to different customers, or they preserve the same interaction as the work plan? They preserve the same interaction, yeah. And the structure of the um, uh, ransom contains the 68, uh, right? Uh, it does contain, yes. But they, uh, they can see it, but they, so there is RNA in the density, but it's unclear what that is. So, it's most likely associated with plant RNA. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Or what do you think? And we move on. So, I will introduce your microphone. Now, the speaker is uh, Macayara Lero. And. Hi everyone, my name is Michaela and I'm a PhD student in the Tuskegee Lab and I'm very excited to talk to you all today about my work toward investigating the role of charged residues in the portal window beam and how they may be playing a role in the DNA packaging process in bacteriophage P22. So in P22, portal protein monomers interact with scaffolding proteins to form a portal ring complex which acts as the site of nucleation for the growing protaxis. Once this procapsid is formed, the terminase complex binds the portal and packages DNA into the capsid head. Upon packaging of this DNA, the coat proteins undergo a conformational change, causing the capsid to become faceted. Additionally, the portal protein undergoes a conformational switch as well, going from its procapsid or PC conformation to its mature virion or MV conformation which causes the dissociation of this terminase complex and the association of the plug proteins and tail machinery to portal, resulting in our completed mature stage. So the part of this pathway that I am most interested in and will be focusing on in this talk is the role of portal and how it signals the completion of this DNA packaging process to lead to the final step of maturation. But before I get into that, I wanted to discuss our key player, the portal protein, in a little bit more detail. So portal is a dodecameric ring structure, and it has two conformations, as I mentioned, the procapsid, or PC conformation here, and the mature virion, or MV conformation. In both of these structures, there are four domains, the clip, stem, wing, and then crown. However, the MV conformation is unique in that it has this barrel extension. And portal is absolutely essential for the formation of an infectious virus because it plays so many key roles during assembly. Firstly, it's the site of nucleation for the growing procapsid. It also acts as the channel for translocation of DNA into and out of the capsid during assembly and infection. And lastly, it's the site of tail machinery attachment which allows the virus to actually attach to its host and then be able to infect it. Even though we know that portal carries out all of these critical functions, we still don't understand the mechanism behind how portal is able to act as a sensor to trigger the completion of the DNA packaging process. And that's where my main research question comes in. So what is the DNA-dependent mechanism by which portal is able to signal DNA packaging completion? To begin to investigate this question, I took a look at cryo reconstructions of P22 and some related viruses. 
And what we see is this distinct density of around the portal at its ring domain, which belongs to DNA. And this is highlighted here in the red boxes for P22, as well as KSHC and HSC1. And because this DNA wrap is so highly conserved across a number of different viruses, we thought perhaps that it may be playing a role in the DNA packaging completion signal by wrapping around and tightening around this portal. In P22 specifically, this DNA wrap is found located wrapping around the trigger loop, which is in the wing domain. The trigger loop is one of two surface exposed loops that undergo the most conformational of change when the portal goes from its PC to MD form. And so when I first started this project, I wanted to take a closer look at the trigger loop to see if there were any positively charged residues that may be interacting with the negatively charged DNA. And what I found was actually that the trigger loop is chock full of charged residues, both positive and negative. As we can see here from these two figures, on top is PC portal, and on bottom is MD portal from different views. And we see that the charges make these almost belts around the wing domain in the region where the DNA was proposed to be interacting from the structures. It also turns out that the charged residues in this trigger loop are highly conserved between P22, SF6, and CUS3, despite them having either 50% or less frequent similarity between their portals. So that might suggest that these charged residues are important. Leading to my hypothesis that charged residues in the trigger loop are important for facilitating interactions with DNA that may be leading to a conformational change of portal, signaling that DNA packaging is complete. So to first investigate this experimentally, I designed 66 single-site substitution constructs in which all of the residues highlighted here by the red asterisk were mutated. So positive charges were mutated to aspartic acid, asparagine, and alanine, and then negative to lysine, asparagine, and alanine. All of these plasmids were transformed into salmonella for a downstream experimentation. And the first experiment I did with these was a screen to determine what the phenotype of the mutation was. I did this using a complementation-based efficiency of plating assay, which works like this. We have salmonella that's been transformed with a mutant portal protein plasmid, and that salmonella cells are infected with a phage that cannot make the portal protein, known as a portal protein minus phage. From there, expression of the mutant portal is induced with anhydrotetracycline, and then I incubate the combination of salmonella and phage on plates at 30 and 39 degrees. Oops. And from there, I observe either the presence or absence of plaques. I count the plaques and then determine what the relative titer is. So I will say, from doing this for all of these 66 mutants, I did not find any that had a very distinct phenotype that was either lethal or temperature sensitive. However, I did find several residues that were affected by the substitutions, leading to a decrease in phase production. So the positive residues, K265 and R273, are those that were most affected by substitution to DNA at both 30 and 39 degrees, indicated by them having the greatest full decrease in titer compared to wild type. Of the negative residues, E230, D253, 256, 257, 260 and E268 were those that are most affected by the substitutions to K and A, then indicated by them having the greatest full decrease in titer. This was an interesting result to me because I had initially thought that mutating the positive charges would have a greater effect since we would be disrupting an interaction between them and the DNA. But it appears that maybe the negative charges are more important. Maybe there's a repulsive force that's important for this DNA interaction. 
I then mapped these full decreases in titer onto the structure of both DC and MV portal monomers to generate the heat maps that you see here, where green are representing the residues that had the lowest full decrease in titer, and red are representing the residues that had the greatest full decrease in titer. So let's first take a look at alumine. So when we mutate to alanine, we don't really see much of a change. So here we have a lot of green, some yellow, a little bit of orange up here at the top. But overall, not a very significant effect when mutating to alanine. Then when going to asparagine, this, is, this has even less of an effect than alanine. Then we see a lot of green, green here where we did see yellow with alanine. But again, still some orange up at the top. The only time when we see a more dramatic change is when we mutate to the opposite charge. There we begin to see the presence of some red and darker orange here at the top. So ultimately, we do see a consistent pattern across these um, when we change to either opposite charge, asparagine, or alanine. Up at the top here, we do see consistent orange. And then down at the bottom, there's also some orange and yellow these two regions seem to be most affected by the mutations. And if we think back to how this DNA might be wrapping around the trigger loop, might make some sense. So if we have our top ring of DNA interacting with this upper region of the loop, and then our bottom ring of DNA interacting with the lower region of the loop, that may explain why mutating residues in these two regions results in such a decrease in phage production. With that in mind, I chose mutants from two representative residues, E230, which is in the top of the loop, and then D257, which is in the bottom of the loop, to do further experimentation on to determine whether the decrease in phage production that I was seeing was due to a lack of portal incorporation or perhaps the production of tocapsids or phages that didn't have the correct morphology. So I first assessed this by looking at SDS page gels of the peak procapsid fractions from sucrose gradients of cell lysates for E230K and an A, as well as G257K and an A. And what I find is that all but E230A are able to incorporate portal into the procapsids, shown by the band here. E230A, it's very hard to see. There's a little bit of portal, but I would say that this mutant has some incorporation defect. From there, I wanted to see if the particles made from these cell lysates had proper morphology using PEM. So these are micrographs from crude lysates for, again, E230K and A, and D257K and A on the bottom. And it appears that these mutant portal proteins are able to properly support normal procapsid, which are highlighted by the blue arrows, procapsid production, as well as phage production, indicated by the red arrows here. So it's really a confusing mystery as to if they can incorporate portal into the procapsids and can make normal looking procapsids and phages, then what is the problem? Why are we seeing this decrease in phage production? And to address this, I then wanted to ask the question of, well, what happens when we change all of the charges in this loop? I hypothesized that maybe this would give us a more dramatic phenotype as we're mutating all of the charges and therefore affecting the charge balance. And so again, I did the same efficiency of plating assay. But just back up one second before I do talk about that. Um, these are just figures showing the electrostatic maps of the wild type up on the top, and then what happens when we mutate all the negatives to alanine, all the negatives to lysine, opposite charge, all the positives to alanine, and then all the positives to aspartic acid, the opposite charge. Now I'll get into the results of those efficiency of coding assays. And what I found was that mutating all of the charges all at once did not result in a greater decrease in phage titer. So mutating everything to alanine didn't do anything. And then mutating 
all of the negatives and positives to the opposite charge resulted in fold decreases that were very comparable to the single site substitutions. So this is a really crazy result, not exactly what I expected. But overall, I've shown that mutations to some of the charged residues in the loop result in a decrease in the stage production. But the reason for this is still a mystery. They're able to incorporate their portals, they can make stages just fine. But when we change all of the charges, we still see a similar decrease to the single site substitutions. So, what is happening? So, the results of the changing all of the charges might suggest that this hypothesis is wrong and that the charges aren't important for anything. And maybe it's actually some structure, um, structural reason for why mutating these residues is affecting the phase production. So to address, to address that, I plan to truncate the loop in this region highlighted here in red to see how chopping off part of the loop and making it shorter affects stage production and seeing if it's just a structural reason for why affecting this loop changes the uh, stage production. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening today. And then I'd like to thank my PI, Dr. Carol Teshke, as well as all of my Teshke lab members, uh, former lab members as well, as the PVA organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk today, and then NIH for funding. I'll uh, take any questions. Too many hands. We have time. So I'll just start from here. Oh, hi. Beautiful talk. Have you measured the amount of DNA package inside? I have not done that yet. But there is a fluorescence based assay that I've looked into using to quantify the amount of DNA that's packaged. Not being no. talk, really wonderful. So, is it possible that the motility of that loop is affected? So, there is actually a mechanic difference that you've got in the functioning of that loop. So, so that's the, the conclusion that seems most plausible, right? Yes, because in going from the pro to mature virion confirmation, the loop actually splits inward. So, possibly mutating those residues is affecting the ability of this. So maybe check this MD or some techniques. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, great talk. Um, so that uh, peptide that you're looking at is a really, I think, good example for an intrinsically disordered protein. And so you would expect that they contain a lot of charged residues. So did you break this down to a peptide level just to study the um, degree of um, yeah, unfolding or foldedness, say, in a CD experiment, just to understand I mean, these uh, regions structure when they bind something, in this case DNA, and perhaps uh, yeah, the delicate uh, balance of charged and uncharged residues would indeed uh, yeah, manage DNA interactions during um, packaging. Um, and, and this is the reason why you um, see this mixture, and maybe you s just study this peptide to see whether certain mutants would be more unfolded than others or would interact with the DNA better than others. That's a good suggestion. I've not done that, though. I'm on America's Most Talented. Um, two questions. Oh, thank you. Again. Uh, two questions. Have you looked at the specific infectivity of the phages you are making? Because it looks like your assay, which is the best, easiest assay, is an efficiency of plating, but correlating maybe dead particles or non infectious particles to that. You don't often see a plaque morphology difference. The specific infectivity. And two, have you investigated below 30 degrees? A lot of packaging mutants and a lot of systems have that dreadful cold sensitive phenotype, which makes all biochemistry next to impossible. But that's where the defects tend to occur in other systems. So to answer your first question, I have not looked at the infectivity yet, but it was on my list of things to do to test an efflux to see if maybe the ejection protein machinery was being affected by these mutations. 
and if they're able, to, if the mutants are able to inject their DNA still before doing the passing of efflux, because those experiments are awful. If you can actually, I don't, yeah, no, the post got in the lab did them. I wouldn't go near that damn electro. Um, but it's much easier if you can just sort of run a gradient and get an OD reader and compare that to waiting before doing the efflux to even see if you've got those dead particles that are exactly that's a great suggestion, thank you. And then to answer your second question, with this current combination of plasmid and phage that I'm working with, I do not see complementation below 30 degrees. And I have tried putting the gene into several different plasmids and also using different amber phage, but I, even with wild type off the plasmid, I don't see complementation. So I do believe it is an expression problem with portal, and that's why I'm planning on doing the combineering to actually move the mutations into the phage genome itself, so I don't have to worry about expression off the plasmid. So with all of those oppositely charged residues, does the structure show networks of salt bridges or anything that, that sort of reinforce the, the structure? So I haven't investigated that in any more detail. Okay, just three. Okay, well, I've already been talk. So Ben took my question, and he, and he posed it much better than I ever would. Um, just to follow up with what you said about putting the mutation into the context of the phage, I'm very naive at this. I'm a structural biologist. Is there any concern for reversions when you do something like that? So there is potential to get revertions, but I would end up sequencing the gene itself to make sure that it actually has the mutations. You can pick black and then um, PCR amplify whatever gene you're looking at to make sure it doesn't have the wild type sequence. If there are no other questions, I think we should come to the end. And I think now is the last talk for the session in the Oliver Mansell. And I think we know how to talk. Is this working? Yep. So my name is Oliver Bayfield. I'm a postdoc in uh, Fred Anson Street at the University of York. And so today I'll be talking about the structure of 5-CRAF-001, uh, which is a, a phage from the human gut. Uh, so, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, what CRAF phage is, so there was a study in 2014 uh, that analyzed a large number of metagenome sequences um, of, of bacterial populations associated with humans. And they found that in, in the human gut microbiome, this particular sequence accounted for 95% of viral DNA in the gut. Um, so, they discovered this using a novel algorithm that the same group uh, described called cross-assembly. Uh, that's where the phase takes its name from. Um, so they predicted that this assembled sequence, which looked like a phage, uh, would infect bacteroides bacteria. Uh, and it was commonly linked to what they call healthy gut virions at the time. Uh, but 80% of the proteins were, did not show any similarity to available protein sequences. And so for a while it was somewhat of an orphan, um, but then other groups, and particularly these two studies, but also others, Andrew Graham and Colin, Hill, Colin Hill's lab, and also in the family using the new genes lab, they set about uh, expanding these new viruses into an order now called Crasperalis. So we had hundreds, or maybe thousands, of these sequences, but we didn't really know what a Crasperalis was uh, because they weren't any isolated. 
And so in the group of Andrews Cockrell and Colin Hood at University College Cork, they said about isolating the first example from samples um, from humans. So they collected these samples and they fermented them against uh, around 50 different gut bacteria, either from public repositories or ones that they had isolated. Uh, and then eventually, after several rounds of enrichment, they, they got viral plaques from this particular strain of bacteria and gastronomists. And so that allowed us to carry out the structural and biochemical characterization of, of one of these viruses. Um, so, at the top left, we've got a negative stain micrograph and a prior micrograph at the bottom left. Uh, and these are just purified by sodium chloride density gradient. Um, it's a big, big virus. Uh, a lot of proteins in it, so it's around 120 nanometers tip to tip. Uh, some sort of global features got very thick wall because of the major captive proteins accompanied by this other auxiliary captive protein, um, which is quite big for a bacteriophage. Uh, and then for a polyvirus, it's got a particularly long tail made up of these, tip, these multiple ring tube uh, proteins, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, and you can see the concentric rings of DNA, so it's 103 kilobases of double strand of DNA that's inside the head. And so I'm just going to highlight a few of these features. There's probably too many to go into in one talk, but we'll just have a look at a few interesting uh, things that doesn't show up very well. Um, so most of you are pretty familiar with what the asymmetric unit of a, of a capsid looks like. But, so this is a T equals 9 capsid, so we have 9 major capsid proteins. And they're accompanied by nine uh, equally invisible auxiliary proteins. Um, and then there's two smaller proteins, which I will point to, I think that's even two uh, egg fiber dimer proteins and a uh, single fiber uh, trimer protein. Um, so 60 of those make up one capsid. Um, and what's interesting about the heat of nine capsid is that you have a, a lattice um, that gives you two different types of hexamines. So if we zoom in on, on two of these, you can see that the head trimer protein binds in the center of the, uh, the hexon type that sits on the threefold axis, and the head dimer by the protein binds on the one on the side of the twofold axis. Uh, so it's an interesting example of how the number is sort of giving rise to something more than just more storage capacity. Uh, it's affording sort of different potential specificities to, to external factors. We don't know what those factors are yet. They could be host or they could be um, in the human gut. So we're looking into that at the moment. Uh, it's a slightly more visible view. Um, so six copies of the major factor protein and six copies of the auxiliary protein. Bound in the center by the either the trimer or the, the dimer. Moving down to the portal. So the portal, um, uh, sequence wise, this is one of the few proteins you could detect some homology for. So it has some distance, distant re relationship with P22. Uh, I think that's for having structure to an extent in the sense of the, the long C terminal crown domain and probably large wing domain. Uh, the the main thing is sometimes called SH3 like on the edge of the wing is slightly extended, and that enables this sort of interdigitating interaction with this other protein, what would be called cargo protein 1, which fits in the pocket between uh, each subunit. Uh, there's only one domain of quite a large protein, the rest of it is distorted inside the capsule. And then if you move down the tail, so the, uh, the tail tube, the central part of the tail, is made up of this, uh, what we call ring protein. It's quite similar to the tail joining factor uh, found in other places with the core sort of through vehicle bundle. Uh, in this case, we have this uh, beta sandwich type domain of the side, so we don't have that. But these are coded in uh, four different genes, uh, giving five different rings. So the last two rings are encoded by the same gene. Um, Seems quite extra. We don't really know why. We didn't know why. Why you would bother doing that? Most other phages get away with just having one tail joining factor. Um, 
to what we think uh, is the input key from uh, cross section to a rotation of the average map. You can see density inside the tail, and we can, we can model fragments uh, at the top of the tail and, and a very small one down the bottom of another protein. So we know there is protein in here. This presumed DNA stops somewhere around the first room. Uh, and we also see inside the capsule that there are those regions that we can't resolve where the, the DNA packaging is different. Uh, and we know that there is a target protein one located in that region. So we think part of the reason for having this extended tail is, is to store some of the target proteins, including a, a large RNA like uh, RNA dependent and um, RNA DNA. On the very tip of the tail uh, is what we call the muzzle protein, which is the first two domains are similar to the nozzle domain of T7, but the other um, three or four domains are quite different. So we have uh, an area within the beta propeller that seems to gate the channel. This blade that breaks out the side seems to stop any of the protein from leaking out. And the rest of it, we have two IT light poles, these are immunoglobulin light domains, inserted off other blades of the beta propeller. And then from one of those, there's this other mess of the domain down the end, which we couldn't find any known homology to, uh, which we call in the thrust domain. Um, we, we think that these combined domains are involved in secondary receptor binding. Uh, we don't have any evidence for that yet, but um, we think that they'll be involved in sensing the cell surface. And, and triggering release. Um, but we wanted to uh, we wanted to know how this um, how this fitted in to sort of the Kasparalis order as a whole. We didn't just want to study just one virus, we wanted to know what it said about the, the family in general. Um, so in, in collaboration with Eugene Julian and Natalia Newton, um, we tried to find all the uh, accepted groups within the Kasparalis uh, order and also some other groups which haven't been accepted and other representative members, which of these proteins that we were able to structurally characterize are represented in those families. And so we see that the predictable ones that portal and major captured proteins are uh, conserved throughout. Most of them seem to have these multiple tail ring proteins, so you can expect them to have these long uh, extended tails or long growth polyvirus. Um, not all of them seem to have two copies of this, uh, what we call ring, pro ring protein three and four. Sometimes that's combined into a single gene, and they seem to be a recent portal uh, and then some of these other ones, like the quark cargo protein one and two, they seem to drop out in some of these groups. So in future work, we'll, we'll hopefully fill in some of these gaps and try to understand why uh, they're not present and whether they are sort of structural hallmarks for the, for the order as a whole or, or, or if they're not. Uh, and then the, lastly, the hedge fiber proteins and some of the proteins which I haven't spoken about, which are responsible for binding the tail fibers, these seem to be more specific to the, the family that we were looking at that uh, PRESS 301 belongs to. So, uh, to summarize, um, so cross page members of CRASP were previously only known to us through, through um, bioinformatic analysis. We didn't really know what, what CRASP virus looked like and what to find it structurally. Uh, but work by Andrew Sokolov and Colin Hill enabled us to, to structurally characterize by CRASP 001. One of the defining features is this ability to carry a large complement of proteins inside the head and the tail. It's associated with the portal and the ring proteins, respectively. And um, this very large uh, sort of, uh, nozzle, a nozzle protein at the end, uh, with this novel grass type hole. And so these conserved features have been revealed by comparative genomic analysis of this work by Eugene Keenan and Natalia Newton. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, everyone in the first group at York and University College of Cork uh, and NCBI and NH. Uh, welcome to us and uh, other funders and thank you for your attention. <laughs>
is there any speculation about its role? So we we presume that it's injected. Yeah, and there is not unusual, but not unusual, but not not unusual. Yeah. Do you have any idea where they are? Uh, we think because of the, the size of the storage volume inside the capsid, they would be there, associated next to the portal. So there isn't actually that much, yeah, not much space inside the cell. Yeah, I think that's probably the protein that more to do with the um, transmembrane sort of core forming protein. Next. So I have something similar. So the M4 has a polymerase inside of it. Mm-hmm. And then it gets. So the reason for that is so the, the M4 has a multiple polymerase to transcribe. So is your phase uh, does the same thing? The DNA gets out uh, in step to, you know, so yeah, yeah. like the RNA polymerase comes out, it transcribes the first one third. And then that makes some protein that pulls it into the cell and things like that. Uh, so is that how you see your phase work? Yeah, I mean, we uh, work by others have shown that the RNA polymerase does get injected. I'm not sure about the pulling mechanism, uh, whether it's actually required to, to actively pull it through. Um, but there are at least three large proteins, uh, one of which is the RNA polymerase, and two which are associated with it, which appear to have this role. Um, but not much is known about that mechanism. So what are the other target proteins you mentioned? Inside the gap. Uh, so there's the RNA polymerase and two other associated ones, and then there's this cargo protein 1 and 2, um, one of which seems to have this transmembrane domain in it, and the other one, I don't know what that is. Any questions? Very nice talk. Can you assign an endolysing function to some of the tail structures, uh, proteins? Uh, yes, yeah, so I didn't really talk about the, the tail fibers today, but they're more specific to each uh, individual phase. Um, you know, we've got predicted functions for some of those, um, but not, um, yeah, it's still, still work in progress. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. Hi. My name is Haley. I'm a first year PhD student, so I'm very new to structural bio. But I've heard that people's nine phase are pretty uncommon, and that's really, like there's a theory that it's because it might be more unstable, like biophysically. Mm-hmm. Do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, there is one. Um, a few patients that, that seem to say that I have, but then some people also say that it's sort of just we've, what we've um, sort of sampled from the environment that happen to have been used or said more often. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'm aware of a few people's mind structures, and I think there's another talk after, after mine on, on that. So, maybe we'll see more, um, the more structures as well. But, um, it could be that the auxiliary protein helps to stabilize that and it is quite unstable. And that's why it's needed. Thank you. Now, a question on the chat. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. I'm not going to tell you what you are now. So, very early in your talk, you had talked about the caps of proteins having different conformations, like flat versus bent. Um, do you think that those different shapes uh, regulate maybe nucleation? Um, maybe. I hadn't thought about that. Um, yeah, presumably they would interact with the gap of any protein differently. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. I haven't really put in that thought. Okay. So we don't have any more questions. I think that is the right time to lunch. It's one o'clock. And I would like to say thank you to all the speakers. <laughs>